Paul Iberson talk about the uh, the case of Vietnam. I think he's going to give us a slightly more geographical spread than Howard's uh, fantastic presentation yesterday. Right, oh, that's a, a little um, sample of contemporary caving in Vietnam. That's um, recent expeditions that we've had out there. I want to just give you a flavour of, uh, of where we're at at the moment. Uh, and then just slowly take you all back. The, for any people that are around the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, if you played a game of word association, uh, the word that most people would associate with Vietnam would be war. I okay, dare say that people in over 90% of the Western world. Um, <clears throat> and if you ask people to conjure up an image of Vietnam, this would probably be what came up first at that stage of the game. Probably wouldn't have been this sort of image. Um, in the, <clears throat> the 80s, 70s and 80s from the fall of Saigon, there's basically an information vacuum really from, uh, from Vietnam. Um, a trade embargo was on, very little known about the country. And certainly we didn't know much about scenes like this where you've got a nice big river heading towards big chunks of limestone. Um, <clears throat> obviously great interest to cavers, but it uh, took a little while to find out uh, much about it. During that period, from the, the end of the American War, um, there'd been a whole new generation who'd grown up in Vietnam. Uh, these guys would have been uh, born after the war, not know anything about it. They'd obviously had a couple of other skirmishes since. And basically, the country was changing. 
uh, ready to move on, starting to get uh, involved a little bit more with the world. One thing you can't escape in Vietnam, though, is uh, this fellow, Ho Chi Minh. Wherever you go, he's still uh, a significant part of the country. <clears throat> Revered by the Vietnamese as the leader of the resistance against uh, the imperialist forces. Um, and his influence still, uh, still carries on wherever you go. One of the legacies from, uh, from those times, though, and what we've found is that uh, it's a very proud, patriotic country. Um, <clears throat> they're, they are very fiercely independent. Uh, but we first started to get interested in uh, trying to organize a trip there just about at the right time as they were starting to look to open up to the world. Uh, Fortunately, in 1989, a letter requesting permission landed on this fellow's desk. Uh, Professor Nguyen Quang Mi of Hanoi University Science uh, was very interested in having some British cavers over, fortunately. Uh, and being a, a native of Quang Binh province, he knew uh, there, there were quite a few caves down there that he'd like to know a bit more about. Um, sadly, he's no longer with us, but uh, everything that follows, everything we've done, is uh, largely a result from uh, the influence of Mr. Mi. Uh, he was able to, to open quite a few doors for us. Most of them led into rooms like this full of committee men and wherever you want to go, it's uh, bureaucratic, permission, permission, permission from the state, the commune, the police, the army, all that sort of thing. But eventually, in 1990, we uh, managed to get permission to uh, head out on a recce. Just point out where we're going. Hanoi up at the top, Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon as it used to be down the south. The areas we were interested in, Quang Binh province here around Dong Hoi, and then further up in the north are the main areas that we've been to. Um, you'll notice there Hue. Hue was one of the great set piece battles of the American War, and Dong Hoi being just north of that also copped for quite a lot. The, the city of Dong Hoi was basically levelled during the war. Uh, and at the time we went in, they were still, still recovering from that. So on the recce, the first, first caves that were explored were in the vicinity of Hanoi. Uh, this is uh, in Halong Bay, which at that stage wasn't very well known, wasn't as famous as it is now. Um, but being relatively small limestone outcrops, a lot of the caves were remnants and pretty short. We had our first experience of caving by boat in places like Nimbin province. Uh, and it's pretty obvious that uh, water is going to be a feature of most of the expeditions there. Uh, by the end of the reconnaissance expedition, we finally got down to Quang Binh province. This is a contemporary photograph of the area around Son Chak. Um, typical agricultural landscape, farming fish in the bomb craters. Uh, main industry in the area is rattan, and also there was a bit of a thriving scrap metal industry as they dragged uh, bomb cases out of the, uh, <coughs> out of the jungle. Uh, this was the main reason why people wanted us to go down uh, Fong Nya Cave. All the water there comes from a cave. Uh, which they used during the war as a hospital, and you can get a boat in there. Again, caving by boat, surveying by boat, photographing by boat. Spectacular cave, huge draft coming out of it. Uh, and it went for about a kilometre and a half in the boats. Then, then found some dry passages, a couple of chambers. Um, and at the end of the expedition, it was left wide open, absolutely wide open, looking up a big river passage. So... Uh, Clearly, a return was definitely in order. Two years later, everything was organised again. Back in Sonchak, not really changed very much. A few more bicycles, but that was about the only advance, really. Everything else more or less the same. Uh, and this is the shot. This is where it was left in 1990. 92, we took it about another six kilometres and essentially went right through the hill. The, uh, the cave ended at a choke at the far end, a bit huge collapse choke. But uh, it had gone basically through to the other side of the hill. After that, we started to concentrate our efforts on the, uh, the hills behind and look for the source of the water feeding Fong Nya. It was a huge flow, huge river that comes out. It was obviously draining quite a large catchment area. Uh, this typical terrain, very inhospitable, only a few limited access roads. Um, this is the main road, and this is the uh, highway number 20, one of the Ho Chi Minh trails, one of the many Ho Chi Minh trails. And this is basically the only one navigable by any sort of vehicle. Uh, the Russian uh, jeeps didn't quite prove up to it, though. So most of the journeys were in these big rascals, six-wheel trucks sat in the back, overhanging vegetation, all sorts of wildlife landing in the truck as you drove under. Uh, proper adventure. 
get to the road head, still one or two relics around from the war. Uh, and just a quick note on this one. Howard and Deb um, have been amazing driving force behind the Vietnam expeditions and uh, their enthusiasm and commitment has been uh, one of the things that's helped us to get such good results over the years. It can also be quite a diplomat at times. Once off the road, Ed, this is typical sort of terrain, heading out towards where we think the, uh, the sinks are or some of the other sections of the cave as we've gone up the watercourse. This is a cave called Hang Bomb. Uh, another, it was a second system, not the main Phong Nha water, it was a further round into the next valley. Uh, that's about a kilometre and a half, or about a kilometre through to the, uh, the daylight at that point. Uh, and at the, at the daylight, we then got into an intersection with some higher level passages, first real uh, multi-level development, convinces there was, uh, that we're on something big. Some of the high level was pretty uh, spectacular. Um, eventually, this section led us back out to a, a, dry, a new dry entrance, not far from the main resurgence. Uh, and 20 years later, they've actually made it into a show cave. Following, <clears throat> excuse me, following up the water course, we, we lost the main flow of the water from, from the hang bomb system, but we went up into a few kind of small overflows. This hanged a cow, um, and there was three or four five maybe sections that were followed back up, 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 up. We're following the water all the way back upstream. Um, we also looked at the downstream top sink. This is a cave called Rook Karoon. Uh, main Phong Nha water sinking at that point. Sorry, Hang Bomb water. Uh, and this ended the sump. Now, from the sump to one of the inlets in Hang Vom, uh, there is still a six kilometer gap that we've never found. So there's still, still a few things to do. Uh, this cave was at the very end of Road 20, so you got an eight-hour journey in one of those big trucks bouncing and bumbling along up to uh, the little place, which seemed like the end of the earth at the time. Um, and then from the end of the earth, went on another one-day walk around to some sinks at the, the very top end of the limestone, right way up near the Lau border and up at the, uh, on the sandstone capping. That led us into this little rascal, a cave called Kairi, Hang Kairi. Uh, 19 kilometres, all explored from the top end, which is beyond the end of the earth and a uh, proper expedition at the time. Um, the main river passage down Hankeri is about 10 kilometres. Uh, spectacular stuff. Uh, obviously, exploring downstream at this stage was uh, a bit more difficult and more tiring on the way out. That kind of took us towards the end of the 90s, and uh, as we got towards the end of the 90s, we were also invited to head up to the, the north, up towards the Chinese border. <coughs> because um, there's a lot of caves up there the Vietnamese wanted us to, uh, to go and have a look at as well. Scenery is quite different in the north. This is much more like some of the classic uh, tower casts that you see from uh, China and that sort of area. A lot more agricultural, um, very little jungle in that area, and the old hydroelectric, ele the hydroelectric systems. Buildings are the same, but one of the real noticeable features is the people change. Um, a lot more colour in the north, the, uh, all the hill tribes have got their own different colours. Market day is pretty bright and uh, spectacular. Quite a diverse mix of ethnic uh, minorities in this area and also very close to the Chinese border. Scenery is quite different, as I said, it's a lot, a lot more arid, a lot more agricultural. Um, and at the time we didn't have particularly good maps, so as we were sat around in Committee, uh, committee meetings, that sort of thing. The, all the local committees had maps on the wall. So as the digital age was coming along, we managed to get little copies of the maps that were pinned up on the committee walls. And some of these led us to some, uh, some quite interesting locations where we hadn't expected there to be caves. Certain, certain other caves are quite easy to find because you just kind of drive along and you see a river heading towards some limestone and uh, away you go, we better go and have a look at that one. <clears throat> Standard stream sink up in uh, Kaobang province. Uh, once we got into these, the, the caves weren't quite as extensive as down in the, in the south, uh, but they were pretty spectacular in parts. Predominantly, the stuff up there was kind of two, three, four kilometres sections of cave. A lot of river caves, a lot of swimming. Um, standard size, not quite the, the huge section of cave down in the south, uh, in the south and central, but also quite well decorated. Um, <clears throat> This is a cave in a Langshan province called Nyan Ban Sam. 
Uh, we call it Kawasaki Cave because Mick Numwick where I kind of could drive his Kawasaki down it. We also found one or two interesting uses of bamboo as we were going around the north. Bamboo bridges, not the most stable of things. Bamboo ferries, even less stable when Watto was on them. And then we had a bamboo raft across a, a, a huge lake. They said it would save us a long, long walk. And uh, at this point, Howard would have walked any sort of distance to not be on that raft. He's not the best of swimmers. This was the main, re main method of getting around in the north. Uh, these little Russian jeeps, cracking things, used to go everywhere. Ford the river, no problem. Rough roads, no problem. Um, at this point, there, there's apparently a, a, a suitable Ford, and the, the guy in front of the guy behind had a bit of a discussion. Uh, and I, our limited Vietnamese kind of uh, worked out that he said, the one in front said, follow me, it'll be right. <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't. Um, <clears throat> That was the least of the danger. One of the things about northern Vietnam is it's, it's very hilly, very, the roads are really windy, and around this sort of time, there were getting to be a lot more vehicles on the road with uh, some inevitable consequences. Fortunately, nobody's hurting this one, but this is uh, one of the, the, the main risks. So, quick, uh, quick recap over a series of about four expeditions up to the north. We surveyed something like 150 kilometers. I've not got an exact figure, but this is a typical sort of passage. Had some really great times. Uh, interesting area, uh, still loads more to do up there. Uh, and we're hoping to get back there before too long. So as we're now getting to the early noughties, we're heading back on down to, uh, to Quang Bim. Done automobiles, now we thought we'd try trains. Uh, the overnight sleeper from Hanoi was, uh, was an alternative to a two day drive in a bus. Uh, although the accommodation left a bit to des be desired, really. Uh, one option was to pay 100,000 dong to go in a little uh, air-conditioned cabin, and to this day, it's the best £2.50 I've ever spent. <laughs> so, back down to Phong Nha. Phong Nha, things had changed slightly by, the, uh, by this sort of time. These are the, um, the boats that are getting ready to take tourists up to Phong Nha Show Cave. And here we go, from our little hand, hand um, road boats that were used in the early days, constant stream of tourists. At, by this stage, they're getting over half a million tourists a year to go and visit Phong Nha Cave. Uh, they'd even built a little visitor center up, the, uh, up outside the entrance, usual amount of tap to be sold out there. Uh, but fortunately, they restrict them just to the entrance of the, uh, of the first part of the, the river passage. So the rest of it still uh, remains pristine. We were still stuck on the big trucks. Uh, unfortunately, in the intervening period, they all got a bit older. They didn't, uh, didn't run quite as well as they had done. Uh, breakdowns are just a fact of life. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, breakdowns is that you can get to know the locals a bit better. A bit better. Uh, now, warning for anybody that's out there, if you see these sort of rascals, plastic containers, and they produce a strange colourless liquid, don't go anywhere near it. <clears throat> anyway, from the roadhead, usual, uh, usual procession. The, the Vietnamese uh, lads say, oh, come on over here. We know there's a cave over this way. Um, and you follow them into the jungle thinking, there's no cave over here. But then, sure enough, off we go. Down into, find a water course, head on down to some limestone. Um, and a fairly kind of average sort of Vietnamese entrance here. Um, we'd never find them without without the guys uh, who actually live out there for all their lives sort of thing. Anyway, this one's called Nurk Nit, and when it was originally translated, the translation was war to go in. So we thought we'd better go in as well, and we were, we were glad we did. Fantastic bit of cave passage. A um, couple of kilometres of what was essentially a flood overflow. And this is in one of the big blank areas on the map uh, where we're still looking for sections of the, uh, of the main water courses. Um, Beautifully decorated, but very little water. And for a long while, it was a bit of an anomaly, this one. We weren't quite sure where, the, uh, where it linked in. Subsequently, we found the cave called Hang Var, which is um, very odd little stalagmites uh, in some of the pools there. Uh, this one, this again, was another little piece of the jigsaw. And gradually over the years, we were piecing together all the various parts of the, the drainage systems. This one eventually linked into Nurknit. Um, 
And it was also around this time, the kind of mid-2000s, mid that uh, the Vietnamese sussed out that we could go down holes as well as going along them. Uh, so they started to tell us about some big shafts up on the top of the massif. This is obviously interesting because that could then get us into some of the, uh, the missing sections of the cave. Uh, this is Sweeney. It's a good job you can't see his face because I think he's quite worried here. The, the next time he touched the ground was down here, 170 meters below. Um, and this one then dropped us into quite a big section of passage. This is at altitude, so again, it's another part of the multi-level development that we were hoping would be out there, and this is kind of the first time we really got in there. Uh, it was also a thing that gave us a lot of encouragement that if we kept plugging away, sooner or later we were going to find, uh, find a big thing.
So there we go. Big thanks to Ryan for the, uh, for the film. Um, Cave can speak for itself. All I'm going to say is it's, it's very big. Um, just kind of put things into context. This is the, uh, uh, an overview of about a third of the, uh, the Key Bang Massif. The Phong Nha system, including Hang Song Dong there and Kei Ri, is down this side. Uh, Hang Vom and Ruk Karun are all over this side. And the third system's over here, but we've not got into it yet. The, um, <clears throat> there's still plenty to do there. One of the reasons we're convinced that there is a third system is this. This is a huge rising on the, uh, on the far side of the, the main massif. Um, we have dived it. It's, it goes deep. It's bouldery, and there's a massive flow on it. Uh, but we continue to look for, for ways in uh, from, the, from the top end. Uh, this might come from question marks from existing systems. This is one from 2016. Um, existing question mark led us into about three kilometers new passage. Another big um, section of the jigsaw. Uh, inevitably, looking for the, the Nurk mock water is going to involve quite a bit of shaft bashing of one form or another. It's also really difficult access, kind of two days in with very little water on the way. So a, a different type of expedition required for that one, potentially. But there's inevitably going to be uh, a few more of these, we think, out there. Uh, we've, we've only scratched the surface, really. We've probably done 25 to 30% of the massif, and there's huge amounts more to go at. Um, every so often we get lucky and we'll find a woodcutter who says, have you seen that hole over there? And then it leads into about a K and half a beautiful passage like this. So, yeah, still, it's been fantastic. It's been my great privilege to be involved with it over the last 25 years. Uh, hopefully, still got a couple more in me. And uh, I know there's a lot of people still, still wanting to go. If you just cast your mind back to the, the image of the people with the rattan, that was 1990. This is Sonchak today in Phong Nha. Um, huge, huge development gone on, largely on the back of the, the uh, Phong Nha show cave originally, and then latterly on the back of Hang Song Dong. Uh, it's been a massive boost to the, the whole area. Um, a couple of thousand people involved directly in adventure tours, um, and lots of other people with hotels and cafes and transport and all that thing. It's been, it's been really good to see the uh, advance of Vietnam over the years. Uh, and last bit really, he's got to go to these guys. The uh, <clears throat> people who live there, jungle men, they, they've looked after us. We've kind of taught them a bit about caving, and they've taught us a whole load about living in the jungle. Um, and every time we think we've learned a bit, they just laugh and show us how to do it properly. But they're fantastic people, really hardworking, uh, really dedicated, really friendly. Um, and fortunately now starting to get some benefit from the, the beautiful area that they live in. So if anybody gets a chance of going out to Vietnam for whatever reason, I'd encourage you to go because it's a great place. Uh, you'll have a good time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. That's a great end to a, a great afternoon of lectures. And I'd like to say personal thanks to all the speakers for fantastic timekeeping. You've all been much better than I am. Thank mm -hmm. you.